It's four days that matter so much to a youthful nation that sits on mineral riches coveted the world over, a nation that wants to shake the scourge of three decades of civil war. The last time a pope visited the Democratic Republic of Congo, it was 1985. The country was still called Zaire. In Kinshasa, France is calling for mutual forgiveness as he met Wednesday with survivors of atrocities in eastern Congo. More on that to come. That was just one of the highlights of a visit that comes at a crucial juncture for the nation that's home to Africa's largest Catholic population, one where the church often uh, fills the role of the state in providing basic social services, where the clergy's mediation matters in this, an election year for Congo. It's also a crucial juncture for the church. 86-year-old Pope Francis comes to the continent as a reformer at a time when the church's influence elsewhere is dented by disinterest and scandal. We'll ask what direction the faithful in Africa want ahead of his next stop, civil war-torn South Sudan, as it uh, tries to mend. Today in the France 24 uh, debate, we're looking at the Pope and Africa. And uh, with us from the capital, Kinshasa, she's uh, traveling uh, with the Pope, Rome correspondent Seema Gupta. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Francois. Yes. Also in it Congo's capital, uh, Toby Kayumbi, Deputy Chief of Staff at Congo's Public Works Ministry. Thanks for joining us. So? Uh, from Ghent in Belgium, Chris Bervoots, author of Congo's Violent Peace, Conflict and Struggle Since the Great African War. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. France 24 senior producer Henri Pierre Mafoudou is with us. How are you? Great to be back. Thanks to have. Thanks for joining us. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. After an open air mass before one million people on Wednesday, this Thursday, the Pope filling the 65,000 seat Martyrs Stadium for an address before the youth. There, he got what you could call a raucous reception. Pate corruzione. Tutti insieme diciamo pas de corruption. Tous ensemble disons pas de corruption. Mi piace, mi piace questo canto. Voi siete bravi. Ça me plaît cette chanson. Vous êtes brave. Siba Gupta, uh, this Pope knows how to connect. Absolutely. He's a communicator. And I think uh, it, it was interesting to see him in that context of the stadium. Uh, really, uh, he ad-libbed, he, he called out to the crowd. I think he really was affected by the energy and enthusiasm of the people here. I mean, right from the point that he reached the country and his arrival with people lining the streets to that mass with over a million people. And of course, uh, today we saw him in that stadium. Uh, at every point, he's just been greeted with such warmth, such energy, such enthusiasm. I think uh, he's just responding naturally back. And so it was interesting to see that kind of enthusiasm coming from him as well. A lot of ad-lib moments in that speech uh, at the stadium today. Uh, he was responding to the crowd. And really, as you said, it was a rock star arrival in that stadium. A, a rock star arrival. Uh, we heard him say, no corruption, no corruption. Uh, Henri Pierre Mafoulou, uh, is it, people there just going through the motions, or is this something that really resonates? It does resonate. It's a very powerful message. The Pope is delivering what is expected from him. You know, as you mentioned, uh, there is an electoral cycle coming, and we've been talking about the wealth of Congo, and this resonates over the 2.300 45,000 millions of uh, uh, the country. And uh, you can be sure that every single month, if not weeks, Congolese will be repeating on and on. As you know, we have a very dynamic youth, enthusiastic um, um, generation right now. And uh, they will be sure to repeat to politicians all over the political landscape is no to corruption. They will be referring to that speech. You can mark my words. Uh, Toby Kayumbi, uh, is that how you interpreted it when the words of the Pope 
were squarely with an eye to the upcoming election cycle? Oh, please, can you come back again? I uh, couldn't hear properly. When the Pope talks about uh, no to corruption, is it seen as a message to all those getting ready for that election cycle in December? Uh, I don't think it has to do with uh, the election itself. But, you know, um, uh, African countries known have had that reputation of corruption. Right? And the Pope is... Uh, one holiness and the guy that uh, want to preach uh, the love, uh, want to preach uh, exactly what the Bible asks us to do, the Ten Commandments. He uh, brought that in that context to let the African people to know that we have to say no to the corruption. Uh, Chris Bervutz, when you compare uh, this visit to the one uh, of John Paul back in 1985, of course, so much has changed uh, since, but. It, 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 it really is when you see how long the Pope has been, is, is in DR Congo, four days. What does that tell you? Um, it tells me that the Pope absolutely wants to visit Congo. As, as you know, he has been uh, planning this for a while. And then we had, we had COVID, he had the health problems. Uh, now, despite the, the, the same health problems, which are still a reality, and an incredible pressure on his time, he did come and he comes for several days. So that is a big statement. And the words he's saying in terms of the, his empathy, huh? he's saying things as, your tears are my tears, your suffering is my suffering. This is a very important uh, message to the Congolese people who often felt so abandoned by uh, the outside world. Your tears are my tears. Asima Gupta, uh, plenty of highlights on this visit. Uh, what's the, the moment that you will take away? Well, um, there was a lot of energy, uh, a lot of joy in all these uh, celebrations, the mass, and even at the event at the stadium. But I have to say that there was one thing really that struck to me. I mean, I think it was probably the most poignant, the most moving moment is when the Pope met with the victims of violence from the east of the country. Now, he had wanted to travel to Goma. That was the original plan when he was planning to go in July last year. He had to postpone the trip because of mobility issues, health issues. Issues, uh, frustration for him, but with resurgent violence in the east of the country, he can't go there. And so uh, he got those victims instead to come here and they share their stories. It was a powerful moment and we filed this report about it. It was an intense afternoon at the Vatican Embassy in Kinshasa. Pope Francis met a group of victims of violence in eastern Congo, an area where over 120 armed groups are fighting for land and power, terrorizing the locals. They shared their dramatic stories with the pontiff. We met the rebels. They took us to the forest. Me, it was the commander who wanted me. He raped me like an animal. It was excruciating pain. He raped me several times a day and it lasted 19 months. The Pope was originally scheduled to travel to Goma in the east, but that plan was scrapped. It was deemed too dangerous on the ground with multiple attacks in recent weeks, a situation that the Pope condemned. I make a heartfelt appeal to all the people, to all the internal and external organizations that orchestrate war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Put away your weapons. Enough. Put an end to war. Stop getting rich at the cost of the poor. Stop getting rich from resources and money stained with blood. Perhaps the strong words the Pope used during his visit here can finally reach our hearts of stone. And that will then spark a burst of humanity. During the meeting, the victims of violence pledged to forgive those who committed the atrocities. A powerful gesture, one which the Pope has encouraged, bringing his message of reconciliation to the Congolese society.
And we saw in that report, uh, Henri Pierre Mafoudou, that woman who was uh, uh, held as a, basically a sexual slave for 19 months, uh, she gave birth to twins, and she's standing there while the other woman next to her reads the testimony. It was incredibly uh, poignant, and she was with those twins. This is probably the moment. I would totally agree with uh, Sima on that one. The Congo war is often called the forgotten war. It's been going on for 20 plus years. And of course, the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church. So you, of course, you have two sides to this trip. You have the spiritual part, which is to meet believers and give them more hopes. And you have the political side. And this was really the moment to put a light on all those atrocities that everybody has been denouncing, but without putting a face to it. You know, uh, it's kind of a soul to what is happening. So people can really see, like, as um, was mentioned by um, Sima, he couldn't make it to the East, but there you go, you have them. These people are faces, they are humans, they are time, they're talking about months and suffering, and there you have it. We, we work in an international news channel. Um, do you share that gripe that we just don't talk about what's been going on for three decades in Eastern Congo enough? I will say that we don't talk enough about it. I mean, I don't want to make any comparison here, but you know, if you compare the coverage of any international news outlets, per se, uh, what you have from Ukraine comparing to Congo, I mean, it's a no-brainer. There's no way you can compare that. So uh, having uh, the Pope, head of the Catholic Church, but also a head of state, and one of the most powerful person, most recognizable face in the world, actually meeting victims, it sends a strong message, not only to the international community at large, but also to the politicians in Congo to say that we know about this, we want this to be resolved. Uh, Chris Bervutz, uh, is it mission accomplished, the Pope uh, raising awareness the world over? Um, yes, uh, I think it's very important. The question will be, how, how will this be consolidated? What will be the um, sustainable impact of the Pope's visit? And the Pope is a powerful man. Well, he is and he isn't, of course. He's a, a very important uh, moral uh, authority, and of course, the Vatican diplomacy is is um, well organized as well. But but um, the question is, how will this visit create a momentum for for a solution? Eh? There is the political situation, and there is in the east, of course, uh, the military situation. At this moment, while we talk, there are uh, there is the progress of M23 uh, in North Kivu. And this, doing this at this moment is almost a statement of the post is not very important to us. So um, I'm, I'm hoping for um, sustainable impact and a follow-up by the different diplomacies of the message the Pope is bringing now. But, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure yet. You're not sure yet uh, that, 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 that it will... Uh, happen. Uh, just to remind our viewers, uh, ever since the aftermath of the 1994 Rwandan genocide and uh, Laurent Désiré Kabila's march on the capital that ensued, the east of the country has been beset by civil war and insurrection. Uh, as a result, uh, Congo is home uh, to the UN's uh, largest uh, peacekeeping mission, the M23 rebel group uh, there that Chris mentions, uh, the one that's been grabbing uh, headlines of late. Uh, but there are, are, are plenty of others uh, in those uh, e eastern provinces. Uh, Toby Kayumbi, um, three decades on, how do you explain the fact that you have all these different insurgencies? We heard the Pope uh, saying, connecting the dots uh, between the scramble for the mineral riches of Congo and uh, the conflict that uh, civilians suffer. Uh, Ms. Francois, you know, it's been over for the past 30 years, uh, we've been having over 7 million people that have been killed in the eastern part of Congo. Due to the conflict that uh, has been arise and uh, 
we have uh, known very well that all this conflict, all this aggression that we have, it's Rwanda who's behind it. Uh, you've listened, listened to uh, the Pope of Kinshasa. Shortly after he had landed in Kinshasa, he mentioned clearly, he delivered a very powerful speech condemning uh, people that are uh, into the exploitation over centuries of our mineral, of our riches that are part of the conflict in Congo. He, in the back section of his speech, mentioned clearly that hands of the Democratic Republic of Congo, hands of Africa, and that message has been uh, a very strong message that has been sent entire to the world and entire to the Rwanda. So today, what we're seeking of, what we're looking for, are uh, the active uh, uh, what that President Tshisekedi has been doing today is to restore peace back in the eastern part of the Congo. And I strongly agree that the speech that has been delivered by the Pope align exactly with the vision of the President Tshisekedi. Uh, Chris Pervutz, uh, you, you hear there Toby saying that uh, the blame lies with Rwanda. What's your reaction? Um, well, of course, Rwanda has a huge um, responsibility in what happened to Congo since uh, since '94. But of course, we we should be aware of the fact that Rwanda can only do that because of the um, weakness of the Congolese state and the difficulties the several governments have had to to re put it in place and to to build strong strong institutions and. Uh, transparent um, governance. So um, you can't say that Rwanda is the only um, cause of the war, but of course it's a very important one. But let's let's look also at, at what's going wrong in Congo itself. Congo can only heal if the Congolese and the Congolese authorities um, reinvent the state. What do you mean by reinvent the state? No, I mean. Um, don't forget that Congo had its first implosion in the first week after independence, yeah? And uh, the, the chaotic time was followed then by, by uh, very bad governance, and that led decades later to, to the wars of the 90s. Um, and the Congolese state was, was dismantled and totally ruined. And uh, at this moment, we, we are still waiting for its full... Um, um, re-emerging on the scene. Eh? For instance, um, we have elections very soon, it's very important, but uh, we did not have, ever since 2006, local elections, even if they play an, play an important role in the Constitution. So the state is, is very absent, very weak at local level, and this creates, of course, the the... The, the, the holes in the architecture that Rwanda can use to impose itself. So you have uh, this dual dynamic. On one, there is a cross-border tension. Proof of it last week, uh, tension spiking in New Rwanda, shooting at a Congolese fighter jet uh, over the border city of Goma. Kigali confirmed uh, that, it was, uh, that it did it, claiming the Sukhoi-25 had violated uh, its airspace. And then Henri Pierre Mafuru, uh, you hear Chris Bravut saying uh, it's also because there's a lack of legitimacy uh, in uh, local leadership in many places. Well, it's true that uh, can talk about power vacuum in the sense that, you know, um, there has been a big reform, so to speak, that we move from nine provinces to 26. And many of those positions until today, since that reform was uh, um, implemented by um, Joseph Kabila, the uh, predecessor of uh, Felix Tshisekedi, and not a lot has happened since then. Uh, a lot of reasons have been uh, evoked. They talk about uh, finances and so on and so forth, but the bottom line, the people are suffering. And of course, if you don't have a strong power space, especially with a country such as Congo, who has about nine borders, it could be very problematic, even deadly. And that's also part of the suffering. I will agree with Mr. Belfoots on that. Uh, Toby Kayumi, when can we expect uh, uh, local elections and for that reform to be finalized? Well, uh, I think uh, when it comes to local, uh, everything has been put uh, 
uh, in position, and uh, we've been planning this for the past four years now, since President Tisekedi uh, took the power. He wanted to have a transparent election. He wanted to have a free election and a democratic election. So as of now, we are all looking into this. 2023 is the year of election, and I strongly believe that we're going to go to election, and we're going to win this election, and President Tisekedi will be elected massively for us. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you're uh, uh, rooting for the incumbent, and, uh, and, and that'll be uh, one way to go about it. Last time it was very tense, and you had an incumbent who was unseated, Henri Pierre Mafoulou. Mm -hmm. uh, is it all about the election already, or getting back to the papal message? Uh, is it about accountability for those who plunder? Well, I think that without accountability, uh, you might struggle to get, like, uh, as the uh, Archbishop of uh, Kinshasa mentioned, uh, three transparent, uh, um, peaceful elections. Uh, point. So uh, accountability matters. That will not solve all the problems. But of course, I mean, they've been talking about this uh, independent electoral commission, you know, who have been working for, for days, if not months, over this and to make sure that this could happen. Mind you, the last time uh, there was an election, we were sitting in this exact same place and it was postponed by a week. So in terms of logistics, we still have a lot to do. And, and so when you, when you think back to then, what role did the Catholic Church play then and what role will it play now, do you think? I mean, we'll say that the Catholic Church in, in, in Congo is very, historically very, very powerful. It's what we call a state within the state. They were instrumental to have an agreement uh, among the political parties in 2016. If you go even way back, the uh, predecessor of the current Archbishop, uh, Cardinal Mosengo, was presided over the national conference, was served as kind of reconciliation. So the church inherits lots of social, I will say even economic and uh, even educational issues, but also part of the political process, not as candidate or so on and so forth, but they actually play the role of a mediator, self to speak. You get a sense see. of that, Seema Gupta, when uh, that just uh, how the Catholic Church in Congo fills a vacuum, a void that normally should be uh, filled by institutions of the state. Absolutely. I mean, they're really behind uh, the health services, for instance. 40% of health facilities are run by the Catholic Church. And then you have education. Six million children go to Catholic schools. So it's really a, a, a crucial role. And then when it comes to the elections, uh, the the, they're responsible for the, uh, a huge part in terms of monitoring the elections to ensure that they're actually free and fair. The last election back in 2018, you had uh, some more than 40,000 observers uh, provided by uh, the Catholic Church in order to make sure that the elections were carried out. And you have the current uh, Archbishop of Kinshasa and uh, the Cardinal. He has already said to an appeal to the residents and citizens of the country to register to vote and make sure that they go out to vote. So it's very much part of the democratic process. Uh, and so, um, and I think it's interesting to note that, you know, in terms of all the divisions in this country, whether it's tribal, uh, whether it's a different kinds of economic interests, uh, there are lots of divisions. But the one thing most people seem to agree on is that they listen to the Pope. They listen to Pope Francis. And I think that is the effect of uh, the Catholic Church here. Uh, it, it's a long-standing one. They are on the ground uh, in terms of the priests on the ground. And so it's, it's across the board throughout the country. And, and so that message that we heard from him uh, uh, denouncing uh, and connecting the dots between uh, the, all that vast mineral wealth, we could run the list long. I guess it starts with uh, uh, things like cobalt uh, that are so important to the economy the world over, the, uh, 
there's a piece of, uh, as the saying goes, uh, of Congo in our phones that we hold in our pockets. Uh, uh, and the fact that you have the violence there, that connecting of the, the dots, uh, it's an obvious statement for those who follow uh, the situation in eastern Congo closely. But how important was it that he state these, this so explicitly? The key issue by him coming here uh, to this continent, by coming to Congo, he's really shining a spotlight on a part of the world that nobody is following very much anymore. Uh, you have conflicts happening in other parts of the world. You have conflicts in Ukraine uh, that's sort of uh, taken up the media landscape, if you like. And so by the Pope making the decision to come uh, to this part of the world, he's shining a spotlight on these horrific horrific conflicts uh, and begging uh, those involved, whether they're in the country, whether they're out of the country, uh, whether they're uh, the ones uh, getting the violence or the ones committing the violence, he's saying put everything down, mutual forgiveness. Uh, that's the Catholic Church line. It's about reconciliation. And I think that was his key message, but also not just a message for Congo, but the rest of the world as well, to keep an eye and remember what's happening here. Let's not forget, this is a pope from Argentina, from the global south, so to speak. So he really very much communes with the idea. He's always had it since the beginning of his pontificate back in 2013 about uh, reaching out to the underprivileged, reaching out to the poor, the suffering. That's very much his message. And he's continued that in a very strong way here in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Toby Kayumbi, how much does it matter to you, the fact that this pope comes from, as Sima described it, the global south? Well, um, you know, the Pope, being part of the Catholic Church, if I have to link uh, the outcome, even the, uh, the, 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 the election coming up, we know that Catholic Church, as itself, it's always been part of the civil society. They are like an eyewitness when it comes to ele election here particularly the, the part that they play as a religious confession, uh, plays a role in the monitoring process and the guarantee of the election. Now, on our side, uh, President Tisekedi is, is a guarantor for the proper functioning of the institution. And they decide to act, uh, to accompany the election, the CNA, uh, to organize the election uh, on the right time and the credible and democratic and transparent, even a peaceful election throughout the national uh, territory. Okay, so standing, standing by the, the incumbent to be the, the, the guarantor. Uh, Chris Bervutz, I'll put the question to you. Uh, this is an 86-year-old pope. Um, he's frail. Uh, he uh, uh, uses a walking stick. He sits in a wheelchair often. Um, uh, but he's, he's, his message uh, is one, as Seema describes it, as coming from somebody who is from the global south. This pope in particular, his personality, how much does it matter? Um, I think it's extremely important. The 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 the, the individual, uh, the Pope, has um, launched an entirely new dynamic. Uh, we see that the very Eurocentric um, existence of the Church is is vanishing, and it's it's vanishing because of of a policy. It's it's a choice. It's driven by the Pope, who, who comes from Latin America. And we see at this moment um, a rise uh, in Africa, but also elsewhere in the global south of, of the church. So this, this can create a total new framework for, for the Catholic church and, and its future. I think it's very important. Yeah, because Chris, uh, you know, we're, we're watching what's going on uh, in Congo. Uh, it's a different story about the Catholic church that's being told uh, this Thursday in Australia, where there were protests outside the funeral of Cardinal Pell, who had been convicted for sex crimes. The way the church is viewed in Africa is in stark contrast with uh, the way it's often been uh, covered of late here. Um, well, the, I think the Pope is there because his uh, predecessor could not or did not dare to deal with with. with uh, the problems, including problems of, of uh, sexual abuse, um, 
I do think that that also believe, uh, existed in, in Africa, but this pope uh, wants to incarnate the belief in we can go beyond that. And, and I think that is important. All right, when he travels next to his second and last destination on this tour, it'll be South Sudan. The pope will be in the company of the uh, heads of the churches of England and Scotland, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who's facing blowback from his own clergy uh, in uh, South uh, Sudan. Uh, that's because uh, he has uh, spoken out in favor of uh, gay rights. Uh, the uh, Archbishop, uh, 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 who's, the, uh, who's the head of the church in South Sudan, said that uh, Welby was failing to defend biblical truth and his role as moral leader of the global church has been severely uh, jeopardized. He accused uh, his uh, Anglican counterparts of uh, rewriting God's law. And uh, there has been uh, a criticism or at least a lot of notice taken of remarks that the Pope himself made in the buildup to this trip, telling the Associated Press that homosexuality is not a crime, quote, it's a human condition. Somos todos hijos de Dios. Y Dios nos quiere como estamos y con la fuerza que luchamos cada uno por nuestra dignidad. El ser homosexual no es un delito. No es un delito. Sí, pero es pecado. Bueno, primero, distingamos pecado por delito. Pero también es pecado la falta de caridad con el prójimo. ¿Y vos cómo andás? Uh, Henri Pierre Mafoulou, uh, homosexuality is not criminalized uh, in Congo, I should point out. But w w what are the views? Uh, because some saying if uh, the church in Africa becomes more prominent, as Chris was uh, uh, suggesting it's bound to become in the coming years, mm -hmm. it'll be a more conservative church. Oh, that is for sure. And um, when it comes to homosexuality, I must say that uh, in countries such as Congo, it's still really taboo, talk about it. Same way as uh, marriage within the church for priests. So um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, the believers, uh, especially from Congo, will go the extra mile. They think that they have other, the way the street speaks, uh, in, uh, generally speaking, uh, in Congo, it's that we have more pressing matters than having to deal with that. So it's not, not even top of the agenda, it's not even a priority, as far as, uh, as I know. But uh, having the Pope saying that, it's not more talk about, but I'm not sure that people are willing to act. People are more talking about socioeconomic issues rather than uh, uh, those uh, society, uh, uh, societal uh, um, matters, um, as to we can see for now. To Toby Kayumbi, you agree? Well, um, when it comes to sexual orientation, I, I, I do think it depends to, um, I believe, uh, a, of different nation, of different religions. Uh, Congo is a, a secular country. Uh, we have our strong beliefs that goes root deep down into way Africans see things. Um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of a Catholic people or what uh, the Pope has said when it comes to uh, uh, homosexuality and what uh, has been happening in the Catholic Church. But we as African people, as Congolese, uh, we do sometimes take it to an extent where we sometimes think that uh, uh, homosexuality is part of the abomination. But again, in the world that we live today, people have started seeing things differently. So it's, it's not a, an issue that it's very important to us as of the moment. We do have other uh, priority as the uh, security of the country, of the upcoming election, as of economic problem, uh, so that sexual orientation is not one of uh, a priority for us for the moment. Uh, Chris Bervutz, your thoughts on, on a, a church that's uh, been pushed here in Europe to modernize uh, and to change its way of thinking again. Uh, uh, the the uh, the standoff is open between uh, the head of the Anglican Church and his the the head of the Anglican Church in uh, South Sudan. Uh, could we see the, the, this kind of a standoff in years to come? 
uh, between the church in Africa and, and the Vatican? Um, I, can on, I can only hope so. Huh? What, what we, the, the, the mission in South Sudan will be di uh, very different from uh, Congo. Congo is about um, empathy and standing aside uh, with Congolese uh, population. In uh, South Sudan, there is a conflict. There is a conflict with a ceasefire, which is fragile. So the Pope uh, wants to play a role, make the difference in terms of reconciliation. And that's, that's, that's interesting. And there are communities fighting. It's about identity. It's about, about power. It's not about religion. So that creates, of course, space for the different religious leaders to, to, to come together and, and play their role and try to make a difference. So that's, that's, that's interesting. And it's, uh, it, it uh, is important for the future. It creates a precedence for the future. Yeah, after a 2018 truce in South Sudan's uh, civil war, the Pope, uh, uh, less than a year later, brought to the Vatican Rival leaders, Salva Kiir and Enrique Machar, uh, the peace deal has largely held, but as Chris was mentioning, it's precarious and there are plenty of local and uh, national uh, tensions. Sometimes uh, they're, they're even uh, deadly. Uh, yeah, those these images that you see, uh, powerful ones, are from uh, 2019. Uh, Chris Bervutz, the, uh, the Pope and his role there in this reconciliation and the fact that he's doing it in this ecumenical fashion, uh, bringing with him the head of the Church of England, the head of the Church uh, of Scotland. Why does that matter? Um, well, I, I think it's a successful attempt uh, of the Pope to to uh, overcome the borders between 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 spiritual leaders between religion religions and um, I, I can only hope uh, that this will develop furthermore in in, in the future so um, I, I might not be the best Catholic and I can't remember the last time I've seen the inside of a church but I'm a fan of this Pope I think it's very promising what he's doing and uh, he he uh, there is something new and young about what he's doing, uh, despite the wheelchair and his age. Something new and young. Uh, Henri-Pierre Mafoulou, uh, this ecumenical approach, it's something he's tried to do, by the way, in other parts of the world, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, trying to, uh, to, to build bridges uh, uh, e e e to the Orthodox Church, most notably. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but this ecumenical approach, bring it back to Congo for a second. This is a country that's majority Catholic. What is it? An estimated 45 million Catholics. Uh, yeah. in, in About 50 percent, just over 50 percent. Uh, OK, yeah. so that's 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 well, all right. So maybe I've, I've worried. Well, in any case, uh, it, the the this this trying to have an ecumenical approach, how could that apply to to Congo or is it even needed? Well, um, Congo, it's a, it's a case study, uh, same as, uh, let's say, Brazil. Like, you have the, also the rise of the evangelicals right now. Like, because back in the days until, like, let's say, 20 years, you usually have about, roughly about 50% of uh, Catholics. Then you have the other 30% were Protestants. Then the others will be um, uh, Muslims and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, but now it's, I mean, rapidly developing. Uh, so why is that? Uh, that's a good question. I think that um, in Africa, when it comes to, uh, it's a lot. I mean, everybody, generally speaking, you can take, for instance, the example of, uh, of the current head of states, born, raised in a Catholic family, and then switched to the evangelical, evangelical church. You can think the same like someone like Bolsonaro. I think that a lot of uh, um, Congolese are sometimes looking for answers, once again, where there is a power vacuum uh, towards the church, except that it has, uh, on the, in the Catholic church, it's a very solemn way of doing things. They are more, it comes to... Uh, institutional. Institutional, uh, very solemn, where 
the uh, on the other side they are more hyperactive more pragmatist approach self to speak uh and i think that kind of uh put it simply seduce a lot of people they feel more like okay i have certain issues but when on the other hand you think about the rural areas people are so heavily dependent on the catholic church when it comes to uh, logistics to for the health system who's i mean mainly non-existence when you think about uh, the schools, about 60% of the schools are uh, run by the uh, Catholic Church. That's once again, thanks to the state failure. So now that people are more than happy to rejoice on a Sunday, but that doesn't bring them any solutions. So to be clear, most evangelical churches are run by family. It's a family business. It's kind of people, someone I heard, I was talking today with a uh, Congolese priest who was saying that it's the business of God. And people are, where they turn to the states and they see no solutions for their families, you have sometimes two or three generations still living in the same, under the same roof. So they feel like, okay, and when you have on the other side of your streets, literally, I can tell you that knowing Kinshasa from the airport, from the airport all the way to the city center, you have lots of lots of new evangelical churches rising and blooming every single day. This is where people can find hope. You know, when you lost hope, when there is unemployment, you know, some people they just turn to God and more kind of a pragmatist God who will give it to the highest bidder. You know what I mean? So that's. Uh, that's really the, 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 the state of the affairs. Um, and um, the only way for that, I think it's, first of all, as Simon was mentioning, having, putting a spotlight on the suffering, make politicians more and more and more responsible, probably more in a more intensive way than in the Western way. But, and that's why even the others are talking more about the importance of the elections. But bottom line, if the state doesn't provide any solution, some people kind of find shelter in those evangelical churches. And that's a real phenomenon. It's causing a lot of problems. It's tearing up families also. So, um, that, so to that, it's simple. You know, it's more reforms on the government side and be more pragmatist in their approach. Uh, Toby Kayumbi, at the outset of this show, we, we, we showed those... Uh, those scenes of communion between this pope and the youth at uh, during that address at uh, the Martyr Stadium in Kinshasa, where where you are, do you want the next pope to also carry that that label of a, a reformer who connects, or do you want someone more traditional to follow Francis? I think uh, uh, Pope Francis has uh, put some ground some foundation, uh, some connection between the youth and um, the church today. Uh, and, and by that, there's a great message that was delivered by him. As we know, the role of church itself is to, to, to put it in the, the village, to be the, the, the center of everything. Uh, and by there, the church can be able to, to, to teach love, to, to teach forgiveness, to, to teach reconciliation and also to condemn and uh, barbaric and uh, any act of violence and aggression that people are suffering in the eastern part of Congo. So having that chance to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, a meeting and conversation and convey its message to uh, the youth, I found it very powerful because the youth are the power of the country. The youth is the future of the country. So having that connection with the youth will help them to uh, send them, to give them a positive vibe and know how they can uh, handle themselves, how they can uh, uh, have and, 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 and uh, deal with the country and, and, and the matters of the government in, in a proper way. And you've heard the message that uh, came out of the youth, came out of the Pope, uh, when they spoke about no corruption, and this is what we need. And I do believe that if the next pope can take the same footstep of a pope, Francis will be led in the right. All right. A quick final word to the lapsed Catholic uh, in Ghent, uh, uh, Chris Bervutz. Uh, uh, did this has this visit met your expectations? Exceeded them? 
Um, well, I, I must admit that my expectations were not so high, and I'm um, surprised by, by how um, explicit and direct the Pope was in some of his messages. I was um, really happy with the empathy he has shown to the people, and the, his, the fact he listened carefully to the, to the victims. I uh, think this it was much better than at least I had expected. And we'll leave it there for now. I want to thank you so much for joining us from Ghent in Belgium. Uh, I want to thank Toby Kayumbi uh, in Kinshasa. Kinshasa, where our correspondent Sima Gupta is following that papal visit. Uh, Henri-Pierre Mafoulou, thanks for being with us. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.